on the farm. Something is eating your livestock. How long before it decides you or your family might make for a tasty dinner? And what lengths would you go to stop it? Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to see me dunk on some weird journalists who hate people who drink milk. I'll have you know I can't even go to bed without an organic bowl of cereal with the fattiest whole milk I can buy. Today I've got an assortment of scary stories featuring a skinwalker attacking a family farm, Native American monsters looking for hunters to eat, and more. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them on the show. I'm still looking for scary trucker stories. Also, go to eeriecast.com for more scary podcasts like this. Now, let's begin. The following are two stories submitted by Anthony1997. Warning, the following story contains depictions of violence against animals. A skinwalker in the pig pen. This encounter happened half a year ago. It has caused me to move away from the home I grew up in, the woods I've always played in, hunted in, etc. A place that was for the most part always happy was torn to bits. My mama is full-blooded Cherokee and moved off the reserve to marry my papa. So I'm no stranger to folk tales and stories of skinwalkers and so on. Now I'm from what most people call the sticks. It's an hour's drive to get into town and three hours to the nearest big city. As such, we raised our own chickens, pigs, cows, etc. for milk, eggs, and meat. One week, the pigs were beginning to act off. They weren't rolling around in the mud. They were all huddled in the corner of their pen and did not want to move, not even when we brought them food. Then one morning, I got up to go tend to the chores, collect eggs, milk the cows, and feed the pigs. But when I made it to the pig pen, I found two pigs lying dead, chunks of flesh ripped from them. I sighed told my dad about it, and we removed the dead pigs from the pen and buried them. Supernatural things aren't uncommon where I live, but this seemed like a pack of coyotes just got into the pig pen, so I left it at that, and I set up the next night with my shotgun, watching the pig pen, ready to shoot anything that got too near, and hopefully scare off the rest. But nothing happened that night. In fact, nothing would happen for the next month. It was all normal, other than the fact that coyotes were howling more than usual. During that time, I bought an RV. I moved it into the backyard until I could find a spot to stay at for good. One night, I heard the pigs squealing a lot, and the coyotes were going mad. They sounded really close. By the time I got up, threw on some clothes, and grabbed my shotgun, the coyote howls and pig squeals had morphed into a single sound, and it was doing this over and over. I walked out into the pig pen and looked them over. Nothing seemed out of place yet, until I caught a glimpse of a pig out of the pen. I turned and chuckled at it, saying, Come on, bud, let's get you in there before the coyotes get you. I took a step toward it, and then... It let out a bone-chilling screech. I stopped, dead in my tracks. That's not the sound pigs make. I readied my shotgun, and I realized it was looking at me. I could feel heat from its eyes, staring into my soul. I aimed and shot, but it didn't flinch. Instead, it stood up and laughed. I could see legs that looked more human, with hooves for feet and hands. It screeched again, and I took off running. I made it back to my RV and slammed the door. I looked out the window then, and I saw that thing slowly walking to my RV door. It tried to open it, and it began to beat against it, screeching. The RV felt as if it was going to be tipped over when suddenly it stopped. 
It wasn't long before I began to hear crying. This sounded much more human, but also like it was being run through an old TV that was thrown into a bathtub of jello. I looked out, and it was still staring at me, but now it was crying. I pushed a chair against the door and went to lie down, trying to ignore it. It followed me to the closest window, continuing to cry and now occasionally tapping on the glass. This went on for a long time, but stopped all at once. With the return of silence, I finally fell asleep. But the next day, when I went to check on the pigs, I found them all dead, torn apart. To this day, I'm convinced it was a skinwalker. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. The Mongrel My experience with the Mongrel happened two years ago. Now, I'm not sure if this creature has another name, but it's what my family calls it. They've always told stories about how the Mongrel attacked them, chased them out of the woods and after their cars. I've always thought it was just a story to keep the kids out of the woods after dark, since panthers and mountain lions and rattlesnakes are quite common in the area. Back when I was younger, I was heavy, to say the least. After a girl I had a huge crush on rejected me, I decided it was time to lose weight and to change my lifestyle. I began working out. I bought a bench press, weights, and a lot of supplements. One day I didn't get off work in time to do my midday jog through the woods. I got home and started lifting weights. After about an hour of that, I decided it wasn't too dark to go jogging, as long as I brought my 357 Magnum. I got ready, put my holster on my hip, and went to go out the front door when Dad stopped me. Son, you really shouldn't go out this late. You remember what your aunts, uncles, and myself have said is out there. I laughed and said, Dad, I'm not afraid of that little kid's story anymore. I closed the door, put my headphones in, and started my jog. I got halfway through our portion of the woods, and I started to feel uneasy, more than usual. I took out one of my headphones and kept jogging. I got to where I usually turn around to go back home when I saw this beautiful white dog lying in a bush. Knowing that the neighbors keep dogs and frequently buy new ones, I figured it was one of theirs. I called out to it, saying, Come here, boy. A mistake I wish I'd never made. It stood up and looked at me. Its eyes were glowing red as if hell fire was inside them. I nervously muttered, trying to joke it off. Those are some uh, crazy eyes, buddy. And I chuckled. But I froze because I heard it laugh back at me. I felt a chill run down my spine then. I heard it do it again, chuckling at me, and I had this feeling that I needed to leave now. I took off running, and it watched me as I did. When I looked back again, I swear I saw it smiling. It stretched and took off running. Before I could react, it had gone from 40 feet away from me to only 20, getting closer and closer by the second. Eventually, I stopped looking back. It was almost as if I could feel its hot breath on my neck. I heard paws hitting the ground right behind me, followed by a sharp pain in my shoulder. But I kept running. I got to the house and slammed the front door shut. Dad walked up to me and asked, What's wrong, son? Did you see it? I said, No, Dad, what? I just heard a panther screaming, that's all. And I laughed it off. I went into my room and noticed I was bleeding. Something, probably it, had scratched me. It was only a single claw mark, though. If anyone has experienced a similar creature and knows the correct name, I'd love to hear it. The following two stories were submitted by Nixie Historia. 
doppelgangers in my house. This took place during 2019, during the late spring and early summer. While I was a teenager, I was currently not going to school. I had a severe anxiety disorder that led it to being extremely bad for my condition. The disorder was severe enough, I couldn't leave my home without having panic attacks, and I was always having trouble just looking people in the eyes. I was also misdiagnosed with autism, which led to me disliking school even more, as I was treated in a manner that was harmful for my condition, being treated for something that I didn't even have. Unknown to my family and myself at the time, I had severely bad eyesight, which led to me being unable to properly navigate my surroundings or even see people that well. This made high school difficult to physically navigate, causing trouble for me when trying to learn as I couldn't read the words as they were too blurred. Despite this, I was still able to see people's faces and things if they were about 6 to 12 feet away, and I was skilled in recognizing voices, so I wasn't exactly unable to recognize people. I figure this detail is relevant, but I was still able to recognize my family, I can assure you. All of this information is important, as my mental health was very poor, and I was extremely lonely at home each day. Maybe it had an effect on these experiences. Despite what many might think, staying home from school and having so much free time was not as fun as it seems. I suppose in a city it may be different, but if you don't have a driver's license and you live in such a rural area and cannot safely venture outside alone by yourself, I was a teenage girl and quite small, things get boring and depressing fast. Perhaps that made me more susceptible to the paranormal at the time, due to my intense isolation and strong emotions, but I can't be certain. So yeah, I had severe anxiety disorder and depression, both passed down by my parents who both struggled with those disorders, but are now very well adjusted and work full time. But I never had anything in the way of hallucinations or delusions, and I still don't. The loneliness was awful, and I only had my two dogs to keep me company. So every day I would mostly draw, write, and browse the internet. Sometimes I'd sleep in a while as I had nothing to do, and sleep was like some magical thing to fast forward time a little bit. That's how I've always thought of it anyway. At the time, I was not eating properly. I wouldn't eat anything until late in the afternoon, and I wouldn't eat a lot. I was a bit preoccupied with losing weight, and my parents took notice. So every day, my dad would make sure there was something with a lot of protein and nutrients so that when I did eat, I'd at least get something healthy. He was always worried about me eating enough, and that day he left some chicken in the fridge for me. That might seem like an odd detail, but believe me, it is relevant. So I was sleeping that day, and I woke up. I remember looking out my door and sitting up, pushing the covers off of me, and then the door creaked open. There, wearing his work uniform, was my father. I figured he must have come home to check in on me. Hey, do you want some chicken? He asked. No thanks, I'm okay, I answered. All right, love you, he smiled. I love you too, I replied. Then he closed the door and left. It was such a normal and regular interaction, and I thought nothing of it for the rest of the afternoon. Later that day when my dad got home, I asked him why he'd come home. He was visibly confused and shook his head. Mm, I didn't. But I saw you. You asked if I wanted some chicken. I told him, which only made him more confused and even concerned. He insisted that he hadn't been home that day. I know it was real. Something took the form of my father. Or maybe it was him somehow. In Japan, there is a phenomenon called Ikiryo. Apparently, they are the souls of people that have temporarily left their bodies due to strong feelings, often due to negative ones, but sometimes positive ones too. Could it be my father worried for me so much that his doppelganger appeared to check on me? 
I've never experienced hallucinations before, and none of my disorders cause anything of that sort. I've also never experienced sleep paralysis, and my bedroom and everything was completely normal looking. Believe me, my dreams never look the same as my real life. They're always different and distinct. I never got any bad feelings from this entity, and actually it made my day a lot nicer. I felt cared for, like I mattered to my father, and even after I realized it wasn't actually him, it felt as if something wanted to check up on me, to let me know it was looking out for me that day. Not long after this event, I saw another one. This time I was downstairs in our living room, on my laptop. That was when I looked over to the front door, and I saw it beginning to open. This wasn't unusual. It was the afternoon, and my mother got home from work around the same time. I saw her, tired and a bit angry looking, carrying bags and just looking off. Her job was stressful, so I wasn't surprised by her looking upset. She walked into the kitchen without even saying hello to me, which was odd even when she was upset, but I didn't think much of it and just followed her into the kitchen to chat. Well, to my shock, as I entered the kitchen, it was completely empty. There wasn't any sign of her whatsoever. I stood there for a moment, confused, wondering if she'd gone to the basement or if I'd missed seeing her walk upstairs. So first I went down to the basement, looking around to see if she was there but of course she wasn't. Then I checked upstairs, and still my mother was not anywhere to be seen. Questioning my sanity, I walked back to the living room and looked out the windows. Her vehicle wasn't even in the driveway. My mother wasn't home at all. She'd never been home in the first place. It was impossible that she could have walked inside to the kitchen, then left through the back door and drove off again. Our driveway is long enough and our yard is big enough that I would have noticed her. I think it was another doppelganger. Later, I confirmed with my mom that she hadn't been home. She was pretty freaked out, as you can imagine, and we were both a bit on edge for a few days. For some reason, the one that took the form of my mom seemed more negative and kind of put me on edge a bit. It just seemed like it was angry and not as loving as the one that looked like my dad. I'm not sure if they were spirits, shapeshifters, or something else. I haven't seen anything as corporeal as them ever since. These beings seemed very physical, and yet not. I'm certain they were real, but I'm not sure what their intentions truly were. Thankfully, my parents are both alive and well to this day, but maybe it is only your own doppelganger that is dangerous to see. Whatever the case may be, there is one thing I know, and that's that I hope I'm never unfortunate enough to see my own double, as I'm not sure what would become of me then. UFO Experience in Ontario, Canada I'd like to share an encounter my father and I had with a UFO back when I was about 12 or 13. This experience happened in southern Ontario, Canada, in a rural place. It's important that I give some background leading up to the encounter. My sister and I have always had, I guess you could say, a tumultuous relationship. She was a year and a half younger than me, and we were both the only children our parents had. We never got along and have vastly different personalities. She was honestly a bit abusive at times, but we both were difficult with one another. My parents didn't tend to pick a side, but I was always a bit closer with my dad and she with my mother. My sister and I would have loud screaming matches that lasted hours and sometimes would result in physical fights. Neither of us was perfect. I don't think I was completely innocent, but she was much more violent than I was. I liked to use words, and she used her fists. She'd throw chairs, and I'd fling insults. I'm not proud of myself, but that was how it was for quite a long time between the two of us. This one night, the fighting got really out of hand, and I really can't remember every little detail, 
except it felt as if I was in hell and I just wanted it to end. It all led up to my father and mother arguing with one another. I remember my mother hitting my dad, and that was the only time my parents ever did anything like that, ever. I didn't want my dad to be hurt because of my bad attitude, and I ran between them to protect my father. My mother slapped me a few times, and there was some more screaming, and they argued more. My father and I left our house in our rural area and drove to the nearby city to get some food and just decompress. We were there in about half an hour, getting some McDonald's, and we parked the car in a lot. My father was exhausted and so was I, so he suggested we stay in the car and go to sleep for a while. It was around 2.30am at that point, but even though I was afraid of my sister and my mother at the moment, and didn't want to fight anymore, I was much more afraid of being in a city at night. I begged my father to drive home, and he was hesitant because of how tired he was, but I really didn't think I could sleep in the car in an area that scared me the whole night. So eventually we did drive back home. We were nearly to our house, which is in a farming area. We had to drive down past a cornfield, and behind that field, there is a forested area, and it was very far from the tree line to the road. It was completely quiet, and there were no other cars on the road, and of the few houses, none had any lights on that night. I don't remember which of us pointed it out first, but it was probably me, since I was looking out the window on the side facing the field. I saw it in the trees, this large orb, larger than our car, but it was small enough that it could have been any light at that distance. It was strange how much it captivated us. I mean, it was just a light, wasn't it? My father stopped the car, and we just gazed at this bright light, expecting nothing to happen at all. But something did. It began to move closer to us, to the road. It couldn't have taken it longer than two minutes at all. It made a direct beeline straight for our car. Or rather, to us. I still remember how odd it was. The way it moved. It was like something out of a science fiction film. It wasn't at all natural, nor even like something made by man. That's the strangest thing about it. You know how a plane or a drone or any man-made craft would experience subtle movements, like the wind or because of the environment surrounding it. This wasn't like that at all. It moved in a perfect line, not a single error of any kind, no small fluctuation visible to either me or my father. I didn't notice due to my shock, but my father later informed me it was emitting a low buzzing sound of some kind as it moved. All I noticed was how precisely and perfectly it moved in the space around it, around us. It was just too perfect to be something made by man. I knew that right away. In less than two minutes, it was right at the edge of the field. It was paralyzing and terrifying, yet... So amazing, too. It wasn't that I couldn't move or leave, but it was like something had reached right up into my mind and had overridden every instinct I had. My father and I were in a trance-like state while we watched, but then for some reason, and I don't understand if it was my logical mind or something like a guardian angel, or even the craft itself, but I got these flashes of memories through my mind and they only told me one thing. Run. I saw these memories of TV shows I'd watched when I was young. Particularly, it was a memory of a scene from a show reenacting a couple's encounter with a UFO in a scenario almost exactly like the one we found ourselves in. I realized if we didn't get out of there, something awful would occur, and we would be, in all likelihood, abducted. I did not want that to happen, and apparently something else out there didn't either, because this didn't feel like my own mind or spirit telling me that. It was more like something else was trying to prevent the object from abducting us. I then screamed at my father, repeating the voice's command of run. I shouted it as loud as I could, and thank God, it broke him from the trance-like state. 
He hit the gas, flooring it, and we drove away. I looked back to see if that object was chasing us. By that time, it had made it to the road, and I was convinced it would follow us back home, but it didn't. Instead, it just floated away across the other side and disappeared. We made it home, and we were both just shocked and terrified. It seemed like a dream. So for years following, I asked my father if it was all real, if that really happened. It was just too unbelievable. It moved so perfectly and so much faster than any normal vehicle ever could, and it glowed so brightly too. Not just that, but it appeared to possess intelligence, as it only moved when my father and I began observing it. So many questions went through my mind. Was it a UFO? Was it some government technology that they were testing here? The UFO theory makes more sense to me. It seemed to be capable of moving without being affected by the space around it. I have so many questions, and I don't understand it at all. I've always had the sinking feeling that one day I'll see it again. The encounter actually improved my life for the better though. My sister and I stopped fighting for good, and our relationship improved dramatically after the event. It has had some negative effects on me too though. See, after I saw something so amazing and wonderful, everything else seems a bit boring in comparison. I mean, it was seemingly out of this world. Something like that is just so amazing to witness that it shakes up your entire worldview. I have no idea if it was aliens or something else, but it was really something to see. I want to see something else as amazing like that one day. Sometimes I look out at the night sky, wondering if it'll show up again. I just want to know what it wanted with us. I hope some people can find my story and realize they aren't alone. These things do happen, and you're not crazy. There are things we cannot understand fully, and that's okay. The world would be a bit more boring without these things, don't you think? The Visitors From Motto Man I recently came across a listing for 40 acres of recreational land in a heavily forested area of Utah, approximately 9,000 feet above sea level. It was a great deal, only about 1,000 bucks an acre, since the land had no utilities prepared and it wouldn't be ready to build on for years. It shared a border with approximately 2 million acres of BLM land, miles of forest that would never be torn down nor harvested. It was perfect. A friend and I made a deal. We would go 50-50 on the land. We split the property, but agreed we had no issue sharing our halves with each other since we were friends and we wanted our families to always have fun experiences camping out there. Afterwards, I parked a camper on the land. We also split the cost on building a rustic cabin, basically a 400 square foot cabin with a wood-burning stove, a porch, and some bunk beds. It took us some time to build the cabin, and we stayed in the camper during construction. Once finished, we decided to spend the night in the cabin. That first night, we stayed up late, talking about how we were excited to make the trip home and bring our families back for our first camping trip together. At some point, we must have fallen asleep. I awoke to the sound of someone rummaging through the back of my truck. We were a mile or two from the next parcel that we knew someone else owned, so I was shocked someone was in our camp. I quietly woke up my buddy. The rummaging sounds continued, followed by the sound of my suspension squeaking and hearing footsteps walk closer to the cabin. I could then hear deep breathing. Whatever it was coming from sounded powerful. We'd built the cabin one foot off the ground. We cut out a window approximately six feet high, seven feet high at the top of the window. It was a full moon and our campground was well lit. We listened as the footsteps got closer, slowly, until I could see a large figure of a man with long mangy hair standing in the window frame, just breathing. 
Again, you would have to be at least six feet tall just to be visible in that window. This was a big dude. In an attempt to dispel our fear, my friend yelled out, Who are you? We're armed! The figure then turned and walked away, never to visit us again. The next morning, we found they, or it maybe, had thrown everything out of my truck, leaving all the valuables behind. We found very large handprints on the windows of my truck, probably 40 to 50% bigger than my friend's hand, who's also a large man. We're beginning to think that perhaps who we encountered wasn't human. And if he didn't take anything, what was he looking for? Grandma's True Spider Phenomenon From Rude Boy Nuka This is a story my grandmother told me. One dark night in Blythe, California, my grandmother and infant father were sleeping in a queen-sized mattress in a mobile home in the desert. They'd arrived earlier that day and were looking forward to a peaceful night's rest. However, things didn't go as planned. In the middle of the night, my grandmother began to feel as though something was crawling on her skin. At first, she tried to ignore it, thinking it was just a fly or some other small insect. But the sensation became more and more persistent, and she began to feel increasingly uncomfortable. As she lay there, she suddenly felt a sharp pain on her skin. She quickly turned on the bedside lamp and was horrified to see that the entire bed was covered in wolf spiders. They were crawling all over her and my infant father, their hairy legs brushing against her skin. Wolf spiders are a common species in California, but my grandmother had never seen so many at once. She was terrified. She didn't know what to do. She grabbed my infant father by the leg and shook him off, then ran screaming from the room. She didn't dare go back in for several days instead sleeping in the living room. Every time she closed her eyes, she saw the spiders crawling all over her, and she couldn't shake the feeling they were still there, lurking in the dark. Over the next few days, my grandmother tried to make sense of what happened. She wondered why so many of those spiders were in her room, and whether they were attracted to something in particular. She also worried about the potential danger of their bites and whether my infant father was okay. After doing some research, she learned that wolf spiders are not typically aggressive towards humans, and their bites are usually not dangerous. However, they can be painful and cause swelling, especially in sensitive individuals. It is possible that the mobile home was not properly sealed, allowing these spiders to enter. Alternatively, they may have been attracted to a warm spot or a food source, such as crumbs left in the bed or floor. Regardless of the reason, my grandmother's experience was a terrifying one. Encountering spiders and other pests in your home can be pretty creepy and stressful, especially when you're in an unfamiliar place. It's important to take steps to prevent them from entering your home, seal up cracks and crevices, keep food stored in airtight containers, and call pest control if you notice a large number of spiders or other insects in your home. Looking back at the experience, my grandmother realized how lucky she and my infant father were to have escaped unharmed. However, she just can't understand why there were so many. Fright School From Douglas G. This is a story from my life in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Before I begin, I'd like to point out I had issues back then to where I had to be in TFC, otherwise known as Treatment Foster Care. Now, in Tucumcari, New Mexico, there have been certain things people believe to be supernatural. I'm not the type to go off of urban legends. Anyway, at the time I lived with my foster parents, James and Lucy, and went to Tucumcari Middle School. I'd like to point out my foster parents had this alarm system set up in their house. 
and I had an old habit of looking up YouTube videos, learning new things, things that might involve me getting into trouble. Specifically, I got curious and found a video on how to bypass that alarm without using a passcode, and it worked. It was a Friday night and I was bored in my foster parents' house. I waited for them to go to bed, and as I waited, I was thinking what I should do to have some fun that night. Then it hit me. Why not go to the school after dark? I recalled hearing stories and sightings of strange things at the school. In fact, kids believed that this creature roamed the school after dark, one that was said to be dangerous. Maybe they were right, or maybe it was just a legend. So I snuck out of my foster parents' house, and I made my way to the school. When I got there, I decided to sit out in the courtyard. Before long, I noticed someone else was out there. I could make out another person on school grounds. My first thought was that it was just a kid, a troublesome kid like myself. So I started to walk closer to them. Soon I realized they were wearing a hoodie, and they seemed a bit too tall to be a kid my age. As I'm walking towards this person, my gut starts twisting, and I start to hear this growling sound. It was coming from this person. As I walked closer, I managed to see some eye shine from under their hood. Golden eye shine. I stopped then, a little creeped out, and I could tell this figure seemed scared too. It didn't want me to come any closer, but it was strange that another person was growling at me. When its head shifted and I could see more of its face, I saw skin and teeth that could not be human. Sharp teeth, pale, wrinkly skin. That was when I noped it out of there and ran back home. I realize now I'm pretty lucky. Some very bad things could have happened to me. From then on, I understood why they called the school Fright School. And I realized the legend of that weird creature on school grounds might be a little bit more true than I thought. I never did sneak out to the school after that. But I do wonder what that was, or who it was. Some terrifying unknown monster wearing a hoodie? Or a troubled, deranged individual lurking on the school after dark every night? Airsoft at Night From Airsoft Sniper I'm a big fan of airsoft, but it is an expensive hobby. When you love something, you don't mind spending a little money on it. Every airsoft range I've been to never lets you have matches after dark, for good reason. But when this happened, I was still pretty new to airsoft, and I quickly learned my lesson. I just finished a team deathmatch, and luckily won by just one life left. My team and I laughed at how hard that match was when my phone suddenly rang. I saw that my cousin, Tamara, was the one calling, so I answered. Yo, what's up? Hey, cuz. I got a few friends that want to try airsoft. You think you could help us? And I answered her. I'll see what I can do. I'll need to know how many want to try it out. There were some whispers on the other side, and after a few seconds, Tamara replied. So we'll be with four people, okay? I gathered some info and we planned the first airsoft match with them for two weeks later. Eventually, the time came. Tamara and her friends arrived that morning before their first match. I saw her coming out of her car with her pitch black hair followed by three other people, so four total on their side, including a guy I never expected to see. As I walked out the front door to greet them, I was introduced to the two I didn't know, Caleb and Trish. I grabbed the most familiar hand there, belonging to Gregory, telling him it's been ages, and I discussed how I was eyeing an MP40 at a local airsoft store, and I was going to go there today. So we went with the entire group. They were eyeballing some expensive guns. I looked around for some sidearms like a Glock, but my cousin Tamara was hypnotized by a Superhawk 6. We checked out and I ended up getting a free magnum too. That night we talked about strategies. I told them flat out, running and gunning isn't going to cut it. It's not a Call of Duty game, but a real life game. We also talked about the guns that they were going to use. 
so I get everyone's loadouts ready for tomorrow. Not long after, everyone including myself went to bed. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night, and I saw light coming from the room Tamara was spending the night in. When I opened the door, I saw her sound asleep in the bed. I turned off the light, closed the door, and decided to check on some things. The following morning, everyone loaded their loadout into my truck, and my cousin and her friends had their first match together. Of course, we lost since there was no good communication between the team, so naturally we talked about the flaws and had our second match, which we also lost. On the drive back, morale was down. Everyone was quiet until I said, Hey, guys, you need to follow the plans and communicate, alright? We'll practice that the moment we get back home. The rest of the day followed as I expected it. At dinner, though, Tamara said, I might have just found a location where we can practice, and it's in the woods nearby as well. Naturally, I replied, Well, um, airsoft is not supposed to be played after dark, okay? Caleb said, Look, dude, quit being a wussy. I tried pointing out that Caleb had performed the worst out of all of us. Okay, calm down, you two. Yes, Caleb, you suck. And yes, our communication was worthless, but that's why we need to practice, Tamara shouted. I've even got some night vision goggles. At that point, I gave in and just said, okay. We quickly got our things together. We then drove to the location that Tamara gave me. We arrived at what looked like a mansion that was ready to collapse. We got all our things out of the truck. Suddenly, a guy walked up to us, asking, Hey, y'all the ones that called? Tamara answered excitedly, Yep, that's us. The man then explained, Look, you got the hills to yourself and this old house. At this point, I was beginning to get a weird feeling, a disconcerting feeling. I tried shrugging it off, though, and we decided to go for a free-for-all type of match, so I decided on using a ghillie suit. I went inside the decaying mansion. I heard a sudden thud coming from a different room nearby, and I heard my cousin say, Hey, cuz, you ready? Of course, I replied, Sure thing, let's get this started. We came to an agreement to activate our night vision goggles after five minutes. I ran to higher ground and laid down in my ghillie suit, fully focusing on the mansion. Suddenly, I heard a twig snap, but since I'd gotten used to being a sniper and wearing a ghillie suit, I decided to remain as still as possible, waiting to get a free shot on whoever came near me. After the agreed upon time, I fired up my night vision goggles, and thus began our nighttime airsoft free-for-all match. As I lay there, I saw Trisha run inside. I took a shot at her and hit her. She raised her hand to show that she was hit, and in this case, she was out. I then heard footsteps right next to my head, and I froze. The footsteps slowly went from my head towards the mansion, and through my night vision goggles, I saw something that made my breathing stop. It was a foot, a foot that seemed to belong to a corpse. It was only then that I truly noticed a foul stench of rot and decay. Those feet quickly gained momentum though, running off towards the mansion. I awoke from my stupor moments later, and I texted Tamara that we needed to stop right away and hightail it out of there. Before I could explain that someone was here that shouldn't be, she replied, Hey, I just saw you running into the mansion. You're all mine now. I quickly wrote, No, that's not me. It's not someone from our group. I think we need to leave right now. Right as I sent it, I heard every gun go off in that mansion. I ran like the wind, and as I arrived, Tamara ran out, looking surprised, saying in a startled voice, Wait, you were right in there a second ago. No, Tamara, I need you to text everyone that the match is over now. We're leaving, I commanded. We heard more guns going off, followed by a terrifying scream. Airsoft can leave you with bruises at the most, so if Tamara's friends had been shooting at this intruder, they had done nothing but tee it off. Trisha and Gregory then ran out of the mansion, with Gregory saying, Holy crap, something was chasing us. I told them, 
get in the car, start it, and don't ever turn that engine off. Suddenly, another of Tamara's friends ran out of the mansion too, screaming, Run, you idiots! We listened. We all ran to the truck as fast as we could. Tamara got behind the wheel and she floored it. Since I was in the boot, I put my night vision goggles back on. I had to know if the intruder was following us. I saw it then. A figure that looked more like a decaying corpse. A face that was more bone than skin. Faster, Tamara, faster! I called to her. Tamara was gunning it. When we finally made it back to my place, everyone immediately went to bed, and I followed their example. Later that night, I did once again wake up. That feeling of paranoia returned to me, so I decided to look outside. In the distance, I swear I saw two glowing yellow eyes. Just in case, I checked every door and window in the house. Even after that, I had a hard time going back to sleep. Only Gregory and Tamara are now still into Airsoft, and at moments they bring up that night. I've never gone and done anything with Airsoft in the dark after that, because if you saw what I saw, you would never even want to set foot outside in the dark again. I don't know what it was, but I'm pretty scared. From Felix I was on vacation in the US, specifically in Virginia. I'm a big fan of scary stories. I like to read about cryptids and ghosts, etc. Well, during this vacation, I was on my way back from an amusement park. It was already after dark, and we were on this road, surrounded by deep forest. Almost everyone in the car was sleeping by then, except for the driver and my parents. And me, of course. I stared out the window and listened to some scary stories. It was then that I saw these two red dots. They were about two meters off the ground. I turned my head the other way. I thought it was just a reflection of the car's lights. When I turned my head back, the red dots were gone. I brushed it off. Again, it wasn't enough to warrant any suspicion. I focused on my stories and continued to relax. But suddenly I began to shiver. The thing was, I wasn't cold. I looked back in the woods. It was then that I felt like someone or something was watching me from behind those trees. The paralyzing feeling of fear came over me like a wave. I couldn't move then and I felt as if I didn't want to. I simply stared at the trees, unable to move, unable to blink. Then I saw it. At first, I thought it was a big rock, but when I focused on it, I knew that it wasn't a rock. Whatever it was had dark gray skin that looked as if it was melting. I could see its ribs under its skin. It was sitting or crouching, I saw its two long skinny hands and legs. I was glad I didn't make eye contact with this creature. It was looking the other way at the moment. I only saw it for a second or two before a truck covered the woods. When I could see the trees again as the truck passed, this weird creature was gone. But that feeling of paralyzing fear remained. It still felt as if I was being watched. Then came a wave of regret, as I suddenly remembered a conversation I had with my cousin not long ago. We discussed skinwalkers, made jokes about it, despite there being a rule that you should never say its name out loud. A couple of days passed by after that. I thought I was safe by then, but something visited me in my dreams, and that same exact feeling of paralyzing fear washed over me. That creature appeared before me. It said something, but I didn't understand what it was. When I finally woke up, it took me a while to be able to move. I was so scared. To this day, I'm really creeped out by these events, but still very, very curious. Watching me. From Anonymous. 
I moved into my new room in the summer of 2021, having shared a room with my sister for the past 11 years. The first few months were uneventful. Nothing weird really happened. It was around August when I began feeling on edge at night, or whenever I was alone in that room, and it was dark. My senses were just telling me that I should get out, and it wasn't safe. I brushed it off as watching too many scary movies. This continued for about a month, and eventually I told my mother about it. She said it was nothing, and told me I was just imagining things at worst. I began to grow more and more paranoid. I didn't want to sleep alone in there anymore, and I started to ask my brother to sleep with me so I didn't have to feel alone. Soon my brother began saying the same things I was. One night I was alone in my room, trying to sleep, but that terrible feeling of being watched, feeling unsafe, wouldn't go away. I buried my head under my blankets, but after a while, I got too hot, so I uncovered my head for a minute to cool down. When I gazed around my room, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary just yet, but that horrible feeling was worse than it ever had been. I then looked out the window nearby. That's when I saw something that made my heart seemingly stop. A figure stood there, with red eyes, watching me. It was some sort of creature that was hairless. I couldn't see the color of its skin as it was too dark outside, but I could make out long fingernails. I could tell that it was at least six foot ten, if not taller. The thing didn't speak or move, nor blink. It just stood there, and it watched. At first I thought I was just imagining it, but when it stood there for five minutes straight, not moving or doing anything, I knew it was real, and I was filled with absolute dread. I lay in bed, closing my eyes then, too scared to move. I didn't want this thing to know I was awake. Eventually, having closed my eyes for so long, I managed to fall asleep. In the morning, I told my brother about it. He admitted to me that he'd had the same feeling, but he didn't see a creature. When I asked my sister, she said she had seen something like that before, and she had been feeling that awful feeling for quite some time, but also like me, she tried to brush it off. The following few nights after that, we camped out in my brother's room with at least three lights on at the same time. It's been a few months, and we're all back in our own rooms. The feeling and that creature have left. Well, except for a strange feeling, like we're not alone. Smoke Wolves From Gorgamas the Great this was my friend's encounter, and will be told from their perspective. I'm a bow hunter from West Virginia. It was spring, so I packed my hunting gear and set off to pick up my friend named S. I reached his house, and he was waiting outside for me. He loaded up his gear too, and we headed to some land that S's family owned. S is Native American, and his family allowed us to use it and hunt on it. We arrived and unloaded our things, heading down the trail. The forest was full of life that day. The trail we followed led us into the heart of the land. I soon noticed a game trail going off the track. I followed it into the forest until I noticed a pile of dead trees in the distance. I began to walk towards it when S noticed me. He ran in front of me to keep me from going farther. What are you doing? I said. Beyond the dead trees there, that's no man's land. Whatever goes in, it never comes out, because of these smoke wolves. S told me. What? What's a smoke wolf? I asked. They're said to be evil spirits, which have a thirst for flesh and blood. He explained. I ignored his caution and climbed over the barricade anyway, and I headed down the game trail. I found an open spot right next to this large pond. It started to get dark, so we set up camp there. 
We used the pond to bathe. We undressed, jumped in, and started to wash. Then suddenly the sounds of the croaking frogs stopped, and a smell of smoke hit us. But it wasn't coming from our fire. We need to get back in the tent, now. They're coming, S said. We got out of the water and ran over to our tent, hunkering down inside. Then we zipped it up. We waited, and eventually we heard footsteps, multiple footsteps. I slowly unzipped the tent flap. I looked outside, and I saw it. Standing in the light of our campfire stood this large wolf-like thing. It had black and gray fur, giving it a smoky appearance. I noticed its eyes then, which glowed bright orange or red, like hot embers. There was this feeling of evil emanating from it. That's a smoke wolf, S whispered. We watched as it walked away into the forest. Soon as it was clear, quick thinking, we packed up our things and ran all the way back out of the forest. If you ever go out onto Native American land, and you see dead trees stacked like a barricade, it's probably a good idea not to cross it because there could be something like smoke wolves waiting for you on the other side, and they might make a meal of you. Black Figure at Night From Anonymous This encounter happened to me and my older sibling when we were around the ages of 9 to 12. It started off fun. My other siblings and I were playing tag. Two of my older siblings decided to go back inside around 10. My other older sister suggested we keep playing. I was already a bit creeped out because it was dark. At night, our yard is pitch black, with nothing but a street lamp for light. But it doesn't do much. We continued our game of tag, kind of by our back door, which was still in use at the time. After a couple of minutes, my sister and I were just about to head inside. Then we saw it. It was a black figure with a perfectly circular head, almost like a perfectly drawn stick figure, but wider. The black figure was about my sister's height, 5'2 or 5'3. It stood motionless. I stared at it hard, but I could tell that whatever this was had no actual face at all. It was just solid black. I took a few steps towards it as I was young and curious. My sister stopped me. She seemed to think it was most likely dangerous. I stepped back to be beside her then. Now, as if the creature was copying me, it took a couple of steps towards both of us. My sister instantly got frightened and pushed me down, making her way to the door. Then everything happened so quickly. I could barely get up fast enough and process what happened. Seconds later, I felt my sister grab me by the arm and pull me up, taking me with her through the back door and shutting it. We were both scared, of course. Immediately, we told our parents what happened, but they didn't believe us. My dad went to check out the window that faces the yard, which gave him a perfect view of where we saw the black creature. But of course, as it usually goes, he saw nothing. Years passed, and my mother began to believe me, as we continued to share the story sometimes to get a scare. We are Native American ourselves, so we have two thoughts on what the creature my sister and I saw that night could be. I try not to think or talk about it much, as I'm afraid it'll draw it towards us. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, 
another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's eeriecast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to eeriecast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.